be on thing. A preliminary study of gene gases released in Asia through the work and thinking of Hans. Maybe we should just come in. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah I can just discuss that briefly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for <coughs> everyone who uh, organizing this event. And uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to present my uh, ongoing work today. And my name is Liang. I'm from the University of Pennsylvania. My uh, major is in architecture, uh, specifically the history and the theory of architecture in the modern period. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about my uh, dissertation research, or part of my dissertation research about the uh, German avant architect Heinz Rohm and um, uh, the inspiration um, uh, of Gene Kepser and uh, East Asia thinking on Heinz Rohm's work. So um, Heinz Rohm was uh, a German modern architect, and uh, the first building he designed was majorly in Berlin, in Stuttgart, and some other uh, places throughout Germany. He never uh, came to the United States, neither he went to China or Japan, but he was very interested in the East Asia, especially Chinese architecture and urban culture. And uh, I'm, I'm going to show some. Uh, archival documents that can show his interest. And this is one of his major work in Berlin, the Philharmonic Council Hall. Um, and this is another one, Shemika House in Dresden. Uh, but today, I'm not going to talk about these two buildings. I'm going to mention the, the this building briefly. I'm going to talk about uh, a competition scheme that he designed around 1952, 53. So my idea was uh, try to build up a connection between Jin Gapser and China through uh, Hansu. But uh, my ambition was uh, actually like this. So I was trying to build up a network or more interactive connection among the three aspects of uh, thinking and theory. Uh, so I was trying to talk, I'm gonna talk about two things. The first thing obviously is about how Gapster and Shuren connect to each other. And another thing is how um, Shuren was influenced by Chinese architecture and urban culture. And hopefully, we can build up a connection between Gapster and China through the architect over here. <coughs> so, um, sorry about the, uh, because you know, I was switching the computer. Um, um, okay, so in the, Gapser's ever present origin. The second part, he views architecture as one of the major manifestations of his aperspectival consciousness. And uh, especially, he pointed out um, these two figures, Yugen Pao and uh, Hans Rohn. So, Yugen Pao was Hans Rohn's student. He worked for Rohn for about five, six years, and he produced two. I mean, he produced some uh, um, scholarships, but uh, this one, the city in the awakening of the perspectival world was actually a small book that he wrote, um, which relevant to Jay Gapser's thinking about perspectival world. So it's basically from uh, Renaissance to early industrialized world. So it's 1400 to 1800. And he also wrote another important essay called Way to a Perspectival Architecture or a Perspectival uh, Building. So I'm, I, I think this is one of the best uh, sources uh, that articulate a perspectival unconsciousness in architecture. Um, this is a book, Transparent World. Published in 1965 to celebrate the 60th birthday of Jim Gapser. Um, so another connection is that Jim Gapser literally kind of uh, talk about Hans Schroen's uh, contribution to a perspectival manifestation. So he said uh, his new Philharmonic Hall in Berlin 
uh, in this building, Sharon has mercifully and boldly surpassed the rigidity of fixed perspective, uh, fixed perspective and uh, initiate new formations deeply in depth to the new consciousness. Um, <clears throat> so this book I just mentioned, uh, the essay by uh, Ruben Powell uh, enclosed in this one. And in the, this particular essay, Ways to a Perspective Architecture, he uh, laid out three uh, in, essential concerns, one essential um, like ways to design and create a perspective space in architecture. The first one is uh, time free, or the introduction of the dimension of time in architecture. The second one is to overcome the two dimensional thinking from the spectral Renaissance period. And the third one is to overcome the rational consciousness that conditioned perspective. So, but when I look at the uh, Jim Gapser's treatise, this three um, kind of points was actually um, also laid out in a very similar way in Jim Gapser's dis uh, discussion about architecture. So I'm not sure because the English version of the, uh, the English edition of the ever present origin was published in 1980. And the press said it was based on the journal edition published in 1973. Um, so I was wondering so who came up with three concerns first. You know, these three concerns was published in this essay, published in 1965. And uh, so that's the second part of the book, second part of his manifestation of his, his perspectivity. So anybody know who, which, when that book was published? 51, I think. 49. One was the first, first part. Originally. Yeah, okay. So this is my question. I'm just hoping that I get some help. Here, but anyway, so they have a similar idea um, to how to conceive a big perspective space architecture through these three ways. And uh, I went to uh, Hans the Rooms uh, archive in Berlin this summer, so I just uncovered a letter uh, from Gapser to Sharon. It was a uh, letter to thanks for uh, Sharon's uh, letter to Gapser originally to celebrate his 60th birthday. Uh, so in this letter, Jim Gapser basically said, uh, uh, what a lovely and beautiful 60th birthday I had. So I was surprised to see so many of you have uh, celebrated for me. And uh, this uh, dream comes true for me. So I should, be, I should have responded to you a long time ago. Um, to thank everyone individually, but uh, the circumstance of which I had no control kept me from doing that. So be able to do something in terms of saying thank you, I ch had chosen this traditional way um, of uh, writing a letter and hope all the recipients of this letter um, would accept my appreciation. So I think this letter shows a new issue, but they were not very close, right? So this is like a formal letter. Um, even there's no address to the recipient. Uh, but anyway, this also demonstrated they have mutual respect to um, each other's achievement, either in architecture or in philosophy. So I'm going to talk about this part uh, right now. So Hans Rung in China, and uh, Hans Rung was interested in China since, I think, during the Second World War period, because he doesn't really have much work to do during the Nazi period. And he didn't like, he wasn't like other uh, German architects who migrated to the United States uh, to brought the, uh, or bring the uh, Bauhaus tradition to uh, Harvard or to some other IIT, Chicago or other place. But he was, uh, he decided to stay in Germany. And he, with his friend, Hobo Herring, uh, and his employee, a Chinese ch architect uh, name was uh, Chen Huanli, they formed a group to discuss the Chinese architecture and uh, urban thinking uh, regularly from 1941 to 1942. Um, so this is a uh, folder um, contained their discussion manuscripts 
also uh, held in the uh, uh, archival in Berlin. So here, China Workbound is actually like a Chinese group of study or something like that, or Chinese community. And this is the manuscript. Oh, sorry, this is the manuscript um, about one particular discussion happened in 1942. So we have O'Haring and Sirong Li and John Scott. John Scott is a American architect. He came to came back to states after the war. He especially, actually, I believe he came back to Denver. And I couldn't find any um, evidence or documents about this uh, architect's work. So I was hoping that I can also um, try to seek some help from, from Denver, from local people. Um, so nobody knows about this John Scott, this American architect. Um, anyway, uh, what they discussed uh, first is the profile of Chinese architecture. And uh, <clears throat> also discuss uh, the space organization, the spatial organization of the Chinese traditional architecture. And, um, <clears throat> but they weren't satisfied on this kind of formal level of discussion. Uh, they were trying to come up a idea about trying to um, have room the being of uh, Chinese architecture. So in this sketch they produced, showed their understanding of the being or the essence of Chinese architecture. Um, so this said, the most important thing was uh, the ridge. It's actually the, the bump at the top of the building. And it's kind of a, we found a conformity or a, a similar gesture between the roof profile and the people in the center of the architecture space. And this said the Chinese live within and sympathetically with nature, integrating themselves with and under their mind. They understand this in relation to, relation to all earthly and heavenly appearances, and the roof profile supports this. And uh, they also talk about the roof determined for the people inside, the underlying rhythm and the wave form of nature. So I think uh, the key idea here is that uh, the form or the uh, roof profile or the whole uh, architecture enclosure in the Chinese architecture is actually was not trying to separate the interior space and the exterior space, was not to separate the people and nature, but rather works as a medium to integrate mm -hmm. the people in the center and the uh, nature outside and cosmo cosmos outside of nature. So I think the key was um, they looked into Chinese actor and Chinese urban tradition and they formulate an idea that the Chinese architecture is actually worked as a medium to integrate man, nature, and pastures. So, but in the Western tradition, this is another sketch they produced to kind of uh, come up a critique of the Western, uh, um, this kind of uh, new modern architecture, the roof profile, which is flat. So the kind of the figure in the center was kind of in the awkward, uh, comfortable position. We don't know if it's actually standing or sitting. So um, they kind of uh, have a criticism about modern architecture, uh, which produced the roof form as a horizontal, as a plate. Um, so they said people under this kind of horizontal power uh, has no capacity to, to work out. Means that they don't have a connect, connection to nature and the cosmos. Um, and also, as I said, they see Chinese architecture as the way to connect people and nature, and also have came up another idea, which represented in Shirong's work, like this kind of profile of roof. Um, they said this is kind of a roof they produce, Shirong produce. Um, uh, they call it roofscape. So it sounds like uh, they were trying to connect the architecture element with the landscape, with the larger picture. 
And actually, Sharon himself developed this idea further in his later practice. He came up with some idea like school tape when he designed school buildings. He, he came up with an idea called city scape when he designed an urban, larger uh, area of, uh, of project. Of project. So they also have a sketch to trying to depict the form of uh, nature in terms of Chinese thinking. And they were trying to connect the Chinese mountain shape with the way Chinese write their characters. So they said, uh, especially suggested by the Chinese employee who, whose name is Li Li. So he feels that this form remember the repeated mountain ranges in Chinese picture. I mean, I think he meant the Chinese painting, especially the landscape painting. And the great import importance with the wave-like line placed in the Chinese, but I think the, the word should be Chinese characters, the Chinese descriptions. And movement into the house, and then in with the addition of the human being. I think this is the key. So they said this is uh, emerge the crowning statements of their deep meaning throughout this question. So movement of the people within the space. That's the essence, according to them, was the Chinese, the Chinese that's the essence of Chinese architecture and the urban plane. And uh, I was trying to um, find a picture that can, you know, distill or summarize all these thinkings. Uh, I think this is maybe, um, at this moment, this is the best one I could find. Um, the form of the roof in the Chinese village is kind of ever repeated wave like roof profile and the mountain profile in the background. So, uh, in Chinese painting, especially landscape painting, there's no uh, application of perspectival tools like in the Western painting since the Renaissance. So my understanding of Chinese landscape painting was the painter was trying to bring something in the background forward to maybe try to integrate to produce a sense of integrity with the living connection, living condition um, of the real people. So the Chinese painting was also another way to represent this kind of integral, a perspectival consciousness. So I think this is the idea both groups. Uh, one group is this German modern architects and the Jin Gapster. This is the key to share in terms of the essence of Chinese traditional architecture. So um, I'm going to show one of uh, Hans Rue's design to try to um, demonstrate his uh, endeavors uh, efforts to produce a perspective of space. Um, so if we want to introduce a, a perspectival consciousness, that means we want to produce a integral kind of spatial perception, which means they have to overcome, sorry about the title, overcome the dualistic division between subject and object. And uh, there are two ways I think very important for Sharon. The first one is to introduce the time's dimension to the space, uh, space time to make, to make the space time continue to overcome the du uh, dualistic relationship between building and the city or the relationship between the building and the nature. Also to produce a perspective of space to overcome the dualistic relationship between the viewer and the object. So the part that I'm gonna briefly talk about is a um, theater competition scheme uh, designed by Hans Rung in 1953 in the city of Manhattan. So this is the map of the uh, city of Manhattan in 1906. Um, so at the time, it's a typical Baroque or late early Baroque, uh, sorry, early Baroque uh, city. So it's actually a site was um, produced or kind of naturally created by the two rivers, Line and the Nakar rivers. And there's one bridge leading 
to this kind of uh, fortification. And there's a citadel in the center. And uh, in the, this is late 19th century. Uh, there's a map showing people tore down the uh, fortification, as many other uh, European city uh, has done at that time. They build a ring road around this uh, grid system in the center. And also another important uh, change to the city was they developed the city in this direction rather than this direction because of the existing pre-existence of the bridge. So the site uh, chosen by the government was right here. Um, so Sheru, the, the value of the site um, According to Sharon, was that he, he had a very interesting connection, not only to the ring road because he has a perpendicular direction to the ring road, but also has a kind of connection connection to the grid system, which inherited from the Baroque city. So he came up a scheme that produced two main mile volumes intersect each other to create a kind of interesting form to preserve the memory of both the degrees and the ring road. So this volume was perpendicular to the ring road, uh, and this volume was parallel to the main axis of the degrees. So this is a model he produced. Uh, we can show there's two major uh, masses trying to produce this complex form. Another form, another model shows the relationship between these two major volumes and the, the surrounding uh, context for the city fabric. And this is a uh, theater building, so the uh, houses, two theaters. The bigger one was here, the smaller, smaller one was here. So as I said, he was trying to produce an architectural form and to um, kind of uh, demonstrate his awareness of the pre-existing city fabric when he was designed this building. So in this sense, he was trying to integrate the building as an individual object and the history uh, city emerged in the Baroque history, in the Baroque period, and also he was trying to engage his building with the entire historical moment, historical period, of the building from the borough to the late 19th century. And in, in terms of the two theaters, I think this is very important. He um, wrote a article about irrational theaters and the rational theaters. Um, I think this is also influenced by uh, Jim Gapser or some um, relevant thinking. So for him, irrational theater is something like the theater produced by the Greek in the archaic tradition. So there was a kind of closer relationship or connection between the audience and the stage because the stage was in the center and also has a closer connection between the whole architecture and the nature because it's open, because it was uh, situated in this kind of uh, landscape surrounding. And some people trying to perform the traditional way of uh, theater. Um, and uh, this is actually, the landscape become the backdrop of the stage, rather than something introduced in the Renaissance period. Jerome also uh, talked about this um, Trito Olympico uh, designed by Palladio in Vicenza uh, in the late Renaissance period. He believed this building was the peak of the Renaissance theater type. Why? Because the stage design was kind of a strong manifestation or strong manipulation of the perspectival tools. So here, the architects was trying to use this kind of distorted scene to produce a space more deep or deeper than actually it is in reality. So he believed that this kind of 
theater space create a strong division between the viewer and the, the stage. Uh, rather than that, this kind of older or the classical way to perform, to, to conceive this theater space is more a perspective or according to Sharon, that was irrational. Uh, an interesting fact was this paper was uh, written not only by Sharon, but also by a um, disciple of Hugo Herring. This disciple uh, was has a very interesting education history. He learned, uh, he was studying philosophy in Germany with Ernst Cassier. And so he has this kind of symbolic form tradition in his uh, architecture thinking. And also uh, another interest, another very important art historian, uh, Ernst Panofsky wrote an important book called Perspective as a symbolic form. So this kind of group was emerged out of this kind of tradition in the junction of Jim Gapser's thinking of a perspective. So in this particular uh, discussion of irrational space and rational space, they said crucial to the new theory is a new arrangement of the audience. The question is how can we bring stage and people together again in a convincing relationship? The form of the rational theater is its fixed stage, host, actor, and inspector, and the spell of the axis, allowing no escape from the force of perspective. It throws the public together in an anonymous and additive mass of individuals, grouped only by social rank. The irrational theater, however, which per permits dialogue between heaven and earth and the birth of risk, is not partnered by the audience in the uh, <coughs> cumulative mass. For in the irrational theater, the other dimension finds verbal expression. So I think the other dimension here maybe refers to the dimension of time that makes the rational theater irrational. Uh, the audience is both centuated, I, I like this word very much, and uh, divided by spiritual means. And here, an important factor emerges: the irrational theater has an educated role. So, how he designed his theater? So, he actually kind of manu manipulated the uh, uh, audience area into several groups, and he prolongated the width of the stage. And so, every people, every other audience in his seats had to move his head or move his eyes at, at least to follow the movement of the performer on the stage. And he also produced a glass on the back, glass window on the back of the stage to bring the landscape, especially the, the city grid on the other side of the ring road into the theater space. So he was really trying really hard to produce an inexpressible space by reducing the depth produced by the perspectival tool, by reducing the sense of access, by reducing the division between the stage and the audience, by reducing the distinction between the subject and the object. The, this this uh, Manhattan theater wasn't realized uh, for some reason, but he actually realized this idea more fully, I think, in the Philharmonic Center in Berlin. Um, so this is one of his major work. He put this, the stage back to the center, and interestingly, every seat has a very small slight angle to the war. So I was there, I was trying to stay as long as I can, in the building, so I really have to move my body. So I really kind of engaged in the performance in a very kind of strong way, rather than just separated by the frame on the stage, uh, in which the organization of the theater produced a division between the theater, the stage, and the audience. In the building, uh, he also produced this kind of bridge connection 
from the interior to the exterior stage, exterior street. So you can just walk from the steps into the building, with flow out again when you're inside after performance. So this is some of the stair for the platforms um, still function very well. Um, I would like to point it out, I think the most respectable space I have ever seen in life is this foyer space of the Philharmonic uh, Theater. I was there for, first time was there well, three years ago, and I stayed there for three, four hours, trying to create a mental map of this space. So it took much longer than other places for me to do it because it's really like a mix. Or like some other historians said, it's like a labyrinth, interminable, um, continuous, dynamic, kind of spatial perception. So I think a perspective will be the best term to describe this kind of space because it's really lacks of any fixed, rigid, perspectival standpoint. You have to move within the space. You have to kind of follow his direction, I mean, Hans Rose's direction, um, to move along the staircase, maybe to move by this kind of small level change, or even something produced by the structure elements, uh, which framed a particular view, you want to see something, you have to go around, right? I'm gonna show you something later, which is more uh, striking to me. But I think this is one of the picture I think I would like to use to summarize this building. You can see different kind of pavement on the ground. You can see stairs leading to different areas of the stage. We can also see an architectural elements blocking the wheel or filling the wheel. And also we can see small kind of level changes, slopes, a lot of things uh, happening in this public space. Uh, not only they studied Chinese architecture in the 1940s, but they also studied Chinese architecture and urban uh, cosmological thinking after the war. So this is a book I found in his archive, country by Ernest Heinel. So this person went to Hong Kong. He was a, I think he was a missionary, sorry. And he stayed, stayed there, he learned Chinese language, and he brought a lot of uh, interesting ideas back to Germany. And this is the book he wrote about his understanding of feng shui thinking. So according to him, feng shui is another name of natural science. So I think it's very interesting to see how mm -hmm. people like 100 years ago to integrate feng shui in a very different way, very different way as we do right now. So Sharon also used this functional idea to produce some larger city planning for Berlin. So this is 1948 project. So he was trying to do a huge reconstruction plan for the after war Berlin. Uh, even though this scheme wasn't realized or even, uh, but this really demonstrated his uh, uh, kind of uh, desire to uh, apply the perspective for a social idea in Chinese uh, landscape. And also this um, Chinese book uh, about how to design garden, the craft of a garden design. And this is the very first edition published after the Ming Dynasty, who where when the, the book was first written. So he owns one copy of this book. I think this book maybe cost like a uh, $5,000 if you want to buy it in the Chinese market. I, I knew a scholar who interested in the garden design on one of the this book. But in the archive, uh, Sharon also on one copy. Some interesting uh, comparison, you can see this is the opening uh, on the wall to produce a, uh, a kind of uh, interesting depth uh, beyond the view you can see. This is in the uh, Berlin Philharmonic uh, foyer space. And also we can see a very similar uh, way or treatment of space uh, in the Chinese traditional garden. And also he wrote about this. China knows no building in the Western sense. The essence of Chinese building is not isolated, but related to connecting through openings on the wall. So this book might be, has a kind of 
30 yards difference from me, but actually he was brought very close to me because of the opening, because of the canceling of the ground, canceling of the sky. We don't really know how far it is, right? So this is a very interesting way to manipulate the spatial perception according to maybe a perspective of thinking. And also to frame the view to bring the father scene near to you, like a Chinese painting. Um, this We have talked about this earlier, um, like the Chinese landscape painting was also uh, kind of produced in the same sense as in the Chinese traditional garden. This is another building show design in late 1950s. Uh, no, sorry, early 1960s. This is the, the major national library in Berlin. Uh, my sense, my feeling to it is actually there's always more to which I'm perceiving at this given moment. So it's very like the Chinese gardens feeling. There's always more of more. So it's not a, I would say, it's not an in, interior and exterior relationship. It's not inside and outside, but it's actually outside of outside. And also some interesting treatment. We can find a very interesting comparison. Uh, lastly, I want to go back to this particular image. Uh, I would like to say my understanding of what a perspective of space space might be. So I think uh, my critique of uh, Jim Gapser's architectural uh, writing on the a perspectival manifestation was that the, was not introduction of time dimension into architectural space. Uh, the a perspective of space it was not trying to produce a sequential order of views or sequential order of scenes but actually was trying to create a simultaneous sense of spatial connection, it's the spatial perception. So I think because a sequential order was actually um, kind of a manifestation of the causal and effect relationship, it's actually more rational. It's also about one thing leads to another, but simultaneous is, to me, is much more irrational or irrational. So I would like to maybe, through my research, I would like to argue that the a perspectival obligation in architectural space was actually to produce a simultaneous spatial perception rather than uh, a sequential view, which by uh, Gapster, he meant at the introduction of time dimension to architectural creation. So the last picture I, I want to show here was a, a, current, a contemporary Chinese architect who designed this large scale building, but he put ramps, stairs on the roof, let people to experience building three dimensionally. <laughs> and also he was trying to produce a, a imitation or representation of the mountain in the background. That's, that's However, <laughs> I would like to say this is not a perspective. This is me entering, this is wondering, this is a uh, sequential order that he was trying to produce here. But anyway, I, I would like to see a, um, some Chinese actors really have this awareness of the essence of Chinese architecture. That they understood it, they want to bring their idea into their actual architectural practice. Thank you so much. Yeah, I don't think the uh, G is a familiar name or a 